I love it when people tell me all kinds of their wonderful ideas <laughs> about, you know, prophecy and the Bible and all these things that they try to make fit where really it doesn't fit. But just to give them a little bit of kind of encouragement, let me talk for a minute about America in general, especially since we have elections coming up and we have democracy and we have all these things going on where people are feeling uber patriotic, you know, saluting the flag and honoring the soldiers and doing all these things that if you've lived long enough, you've seen it before, so you know what's coming next. You know, war. <laughs> it's always something true about somehow every country, including our own, once you start getting into this patriotic aspect, next comes some war where, sure enough, you start shipping everybody off to fight a battle somewhere. And every country in the world, even in history of civilizations as we've seen the rise and fall of superpowers or of world dominations, you see the same thing happening when there's this rise of ultra-patriotism, especially when a country has gone through an economic crisis. You see it happening in cycles over and over and over again. And they say that to know nothing of the past is to understand little of the present and have no concept of the future. Well, in a lot of ways, even when people know the cycle, see it happening, they still do it anyways. Whether it be Germany with the rise of Hitler, you know, after the fall from World War I, you know, the Kaisers, you know, they went through an economic collapse, you know, and then turned around their economy and built it back up. But they did it on the backs of what? Totalitarianism. And the idea of utopianism, to create a better society, you know, so much better than anything else on the world. <laughs> well, guess what? It brought a world war. That's what the wuwa is about. But when people come to me and they want to talk about, you know, prophecy, you know, I always tell them straight up, look, the Bible is very clear. America is not in prophecy. America is not in prophecy. Let me say it third time because people don't seem to get it. America, first of all, is a tiny nation. I mean, sure, it may be a world power now. It may have had some influence recently. But you got to remember, if you go back a few years, while we may have been competitive as a world-class nation, we weren't dominant as a superpower until recently. Well, even if you wanted to put yourself into just the beginning, let's say 1776, Let's look at it from God's perspective. Let's see. How many world power super nations have there been that lasted, oh, say, only 200 years and God paid attention to them? None. Oh, you mean all those nations that God was talking about had longer track records than America? Yeah. Egypt is still Egypt today. Quite frankly, Gog is still Gog today. You know, Magog is still Magog. Um, Israel is still Israel, although it left and came back. Um, Syria, <laughs> come on. Lebanon, well, you know, some of these people have been around for a long time. China, <laughs> ooh, yeah. You know, kings of the East, you know, yeah. You know, you kind of you get an idea that maybe America, because it's such a baby nation, really isn't that important when it comes to the realization of all of time span and we're just a blip on the record. Now, having said that, <laughs> let me encourage you, if you really want to go there, because you know there's these books out called The Harbringer that you know some guy gets a fantasy idea of trying to make America fit and that wants to warn America so write a fiction story and make everybody get in it but then try to act like it's going to come true and then people will be like, you know, kind of confused. Because on the one hand, the person's denying that it's actually a prophecy while at the same time promoting it as a shh prophecy. Well, well, but if you really wanted to look at America, let's be clear for a second. If you wanted to look at what a type we are, or what a warning we are, or what an allegory or simile we are, it's pretty obvious that we're Roman. I mean, everything we do comes from the Roman Empire. 
Our monetary system comes from the Roman Empire. Our basis of economy comes from the Roman Empire. Our democracy comes from the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, there isn't anything really that you can point a finger at, whether it be the Washington monuments or you know, the things on the bills or everything except for those few places where we added God that doesn't really come from the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, the Senate comes from the Roman Empire. Almost all of what the quote-unquote founding fathers, as though they were founding fathers, they were just men that were businessmen. They sat down and they looked at governments and world governments and they were, a lot of them, utopianists. They believed in trying to create a more perfect union while at the same time trying to make a way to keep in balance those things so they could keep partially their profits, but also their land holdings and their, their businesses and those things intact. They weren't just noble characters looking for some high ideal and trying to write about it. No. Let's be realistic about at least our own history and kind of be honest before God. While God has used America in certain ways, it's pretty obvious that hey, there were a lot of people that were pro-slavery back then. Come on now, that's not all men are created equal. Let's get real. At least be honest about the way that you try to present the Founding Fathers. Be real about who they were. A lot of them, even though they believed in God, you'd have to ask, yeah, really, what God? <laughs> Come on. And some of their actions and attitudes even portrayed that. While after the fact, historians look at it and try to make them look better than they were, which is typical of history, sometimes you need to kind of read between the lines and see the reality of the man versus the image that we want to believe in. And that's kind of what happens with America. You have to look at the bluntness of Rome and the bluntness of America. You see, America goes around the world currently promoting this idea that democracy is like the godly thing to do. Well, not necessarily true. According to scriptures, that's not even something that God is pro-democracy. He's not. Anything that says we the people, other people, and for the people doesn't mean that we the people are the smartest kids on the block, you know, because quite frankly, the way we have distorted our democracy is to create a two-party system. Israel is the closest thing we see in modern days to an actual democracy where you have, quite frankly, 30 parties or more and that in order to hold the government together, 10 or 20 of those parties have to get along with each other in order for there to be a governing body that can work together to be in charge. That doesn't happen in America, that's for sure. We have a dictatorial system, a two-party system, where in fact of matter, that's what Rome had, a two-party system. And in the end, when Rome was falling apart, you had the Colosseums, which we have today. You know, we have football stadiums for all kinds of things, baseball and entertainment, and to pacify the crowd so that they would enjoy themselves and spend their money, even as they did in Rome. It's interesting is that if you ever took a look at how the Colosseum was structured and built, by golly, guess what? That's what we do in our stadiums. And it's interesting that in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire by H.G. Wells, we see the rise and fall of America step by step, walking in step with exactly what the Roman Empire did. The only difference is we're doing it faster than they did. <laughs> we're kind of falling apart really quick. But sadly, that's where people don't realize when you want to put America into prophecy, that's the only place you possibly could. The eagle itself comes from the Roman eagle. The whole idea of freeways and commerce and having a, uh, oh, what do they call it nowadays? Um, business highways to develop international trade so that we would have this global economy was what Rome did. That is, in fact, a Roman idea, not an American idea. Having uh, free trade zones was also the idea that if you were a Roman citizen, you didn't have to pay the same taxes. You received the benefits of being a Roman citizen, while the servitor nations paid those taxes to Rome in order to be protected by Rome. Kind of interesting. The more that you study Rome, 
And the more that you study America, the more you realize if you were trying to put America into prophecy, you would have to call us Romerica. I mean, really, because that's what we are. We are more Roman, Greco-Roman, and Roman-Roman than anything else that you could put in any of the civilizations. We're not Babylon. Oh, you might try to make it into a mystery Babylon, and in some ways you might be partially correct. But the bottom line is that when it comes to biblical prophecy, if it doesn't fit exactly to the T with every scripture complete, it doesn't belong in prophecy. If it doesn't fit what God said, it doesn't belong in prophecy. That's where a lot of the prophecy scholars like to, oh, how about this Psalm 83 war? And they forget about everything else in scripture. Or let's make the Antichrist Islamic. And they forget about everything else in scripture. Or they like to say, oh, we'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to skip the Bible and we're going to look at the Koran and see, wow, look at this. They have a Antichrist also. Ooh, maybe we should like pay attention to what they've written since they came after the Bible and they borrowed from the Bible and they used a lot of the same symbolism from the Bible and they used a lot of the same things written in the Bible. So we'll just skip the Bible and say that now we're going to go with Islam because they seem to know what they're talking about. I don't think so. You see, every time that people try to change things to make America fit, they rearrange their mentality over and over again and every five to ten years you see them write a new book that's different than what the old book was. It's kind of weird, isn't it? But you know, when you look at somebody like, say, oh, I don't know, maybe a Hal Lindsey, you know, and maybe he's changed his ideas, but we'll just stick with the original. Like Great Planet Earth. Still there. Still selling. Still t t telling people. If you stick with what you know to be true from the beginning, you'll see that most scholars have known all along who, what, when, where, and why the end of the world is happening and occurring because, quite frankly, it's written in the Bible. It hasn't changed at all. People didn't suddenly wake up and go, oh, we know better now. It's not Israel. It's America. Well, actually, there was you know people that said that. There were people that actually tried to change the Bible to say that, oh, Israel lost all their benefits, so it, you know who cares that Israel became a nation? It's about us now. And they were called Anglo-Israelism, where they tried to make Egypt or make England, you know, some kind of Jewish stronghold, you know, and then somehow they migrated over to America. Kind of like the Mormons when they tried to invent this whole idea of, oh, well, you know, there was the real tribe of Jews that, you know, they left Egypt way back when and they migrated over to South America, you know, and they started the Incan Empire and they started the Peruvian Empire and they started, you know, the Aztecs, the Moltecs, and the, the every other tech that there was before they came up with, you know, the original. And guess what? That white, you know, guy, Quetzalcoatl, you know, that came down from the sun, you know, the sun god? Well, he really was our Moroni, you know, and he was doing this so that we can actually tell people that, hey, the Mormon, the Book of Mormon is the Bible of the Americas. Well, that sounds interesting. Until you take a closer look. <laughs> then once you start looking, you go, Wait a minute, even as a fiction book, this doesn't make sense because you start finding all kinds of flaws and errors and mistakes that were made in the original transcript and manuscript that's even to this day. You read it and you go, nah, I don't think so, you know. We had some real problems with that version of history and what the actual Incas, Toltecs, and Mayans were doing. Sorry, when it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And that's what happens when you try to put American prophecy. You try to make something into what it isn't when God has already said what it is. God has given us his word so that we would not be deceived by ourselves. He's given us his word so we would not be deceived by other selves. He gave us his word so we would not be deceived by wild ideas, wild superstitions, vain traditions, off and obscure religions or even sometimes our own innocence. That's why God gave us his word so that we could know it, we could study it, we could read it, we could understand it. 
It's that simple. There's no complications to it until you start adding to it. You see, I was always fascinated by how I would see somebody who really was a dynamic man of God suddenly go to like Bible school or Bible college or do something, you know, to add to his knowledge base of what he was doing in the ministry and he'd come back and he'd be very dogmatic, very theological and very precise, but absolutely no inspiration at all. As a matter of fact, he's pretty boring. I think God would have to kind of break them down, you know, kind of rearrange their lives and make them kind of like get back to where he wanted them to be. So I kind of avoided that, you know. I was like, oh sure, I studied and quite frankly, I have my own thesis and my own premises and my own theological perspectives that I could line out and line out and delegate and delineate into a designation of a theological study and scripture and manifestation of logic in such an intellectual way that, yeah, we could spend years pretending that we're contending for the faith, or we can just let God do it. And sometimes that's what people don't realize. You're not fighting for the faith. God has that covered. Jesus didn't go out there and say, hey, i got to convince everybody. Jesus said, no, many are called, but few are chosen. And that's the way that prophecy works. Not everyone's going to agree with you. And not everyone's going to agree on what the scriptures say. But it's pretty simple that all you need to do is ask God and pray today for Him to show you. I personally can see, obviously, the connection between Rome and America. But since the Bible doesn't say it, I don't either. I can see how America follows in the same footsteps as some of the other nations, but since the Bible doesn't say it, I don't either. I can see how America looks a lot like what other nations have done wrongly and rightly, but since the Bible doesn't say it, I don't either. Because quite frankly, I'm more interested in what God has to say than I am what people have to say in trying to make today America fit in prophecy. It quite frankly doesn't. And it doesn't matter how much you squirm, how much you strive, how much you wiggle, or how much you try to insert it and write in your notes on the side. America's not in prophecy. And even if it were, the closest thing you could come to would be, well, they said it is manna, for they wist not what it was. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Your fathers did eat manna. <laughs> wow, that's funny. What a misprint. It says marina. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. The children of Israel gathered some more, some less. He that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered it every morning, and every man according to his eating. Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I was asked just before I began to share this devotional that who would I vote for? Actually, I wasn't asked that. I was asked, I was po there was a posting that said, who would Jesus vote for? And I, quite frankly, straight up said, he wouldn't vote for anybody. He would appoint someone. Because he's a king. And the king appoints people in charge of certain aspects and perspectives of things he wants done. If God wanted a ditch dug, he would appoint a ditch digger. If God wanted a well dug, he would appoint a well digger. If God wanted something done, he tells the person what to do. And that's where you're supposed to be. You see, each one of us are supposed to be able to hear his voice. Each one of us are called according to his purpose. Each one of us are chosen and selected according to his will to accomplish his purpose for his glory. It's never been about my ability or myself or my will. 
those were meant to be told to you at the beginning of your salvation experience that when you took up your cross you nailed your personal freedoms rights and privileges to the cross you came to the cross in order to give up your life you have salvation if you have given Jesus your life including all your freedoms all your responsibilities all your worries cares and anxieties but also your will you see as long as you're in charge and you're not seeking God's will every day as long as you're making the decisions and not doing like he said which was to seek him out in every decision-making process that you have even whether to get out of bed as blunt as that may sound to you there are quite frankly some pretty famous pastors who said they don't get out of bed till they pray and ask God if they want them out of bed but let's be straight if you're doing your own thinking guess what it's your own thinking but if you're doing what God says then you're obeying and you're in obedience to what he's thinking now when we're told that it's no longer I that liveth but Christ that liveth in me that means that as you are getting rid of you doing your thing God is doing his thing by putting in you his mind because we're told that be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God in Christ Jesus the reason why there's so many divisions and strives and challenges to seeing people in one spirit one Lord one faith one baptism one this that and the other thing is because most people really aren't seeking everything in every way to do it the Lord's way they're not asking God in everything where Proverbs 3 5 and 6 says don't trust yourself don't think about your own ideas but Ask me, and I will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he directs your path. He wants you directed, not objected. In other words, most Christians say that, well, we program our cells to be good people, so that way our thought process is based upon goodness and godliness, and we become sanctified by that process of religion whereby we change and reprogram our mind so that we're thinking the right thoughts according to the Bible and I only find one problem with that the Jews say the same thing and they don't know God the Jews say we program our mind according to Torah we do the 613 mitzvot according to the law and we are godly because we have done the law and they do it without God you see the same thing the Christian says in programming himself to be godly is the same thing the Jew said in order to prove he was righteous. Christianity without Jesus personally intervening and talking to you in a personal intimate relationship is as much a failure as Judaism was in the same way that God spoke to the individuals all throughout the Old Testament and the people refused to listen. At the Mount of Sinai when God spoke to the people the people cried out and said don't speak to us but speak to Moses and have him come down and tell us what you said the reality of your personal existence with God is up to you you can cry out like the children of Israel did and make foolish statements like that of wanting someone else to interpret for you and to tell you what God said and you'll find that just like the children of Israel you will rebel against Moses at some point in time you will rebel against that person because you really aren't taking personal accountability and responsibility for who you are before God that is the nature of God's government it's a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship it's not something you can shuffle off to someone else and say well the pastor told me or the Bible said or you know Christianity said or you know I never heard or I didn't know you do you see God said in the book of Romans that because he's writing to Romans much like Americans that you have known God at some point in time but you chose not to listen you chose to change the image of God in some way you chose not to do as he said but to do as you wanted him to say or as you thought he would say you chose prosperity over obedience you chose to 
proffer a form of godliness without the power thereof. There's only one way that a Christian is a Christian, and that's if Jesus is in them. And that's the only way that a Christian is a Christian. It's not about making yourself feel like you love everybody, because real quickly you can find out you don't. You can put President Obama in your first checklist and see how fast you react to those words. And if you react in any other way except for God put him there, then guess what? You failed. And you'll fail that test. But you see, if God is in you, we're told he is the hope of glory. He is the one in us that is changing us and making us into the image of the incorruptible God. He is the one that really is the manifestation that causes the realization of the people around us to see that there's something and someone different about us. It could be called a Christian possession. Jesus possessing us in a possession of his obsession of love for us that he lives in us as he promised he would when he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come into him and sup with him. I will come into him. And the interesting thing is, when that was written to Christians, it was written to those who had failed in realizing they were going about their religious duties without ever seeking God in the first place. Because they never knew when God was standing on the outside. Because they had already put themselves back in charge on the inside.